Welcome Classic Rock fans to another one of my ranking videos and today I want to look at the studio albums of Rush. Deja Vu I hear you say, of course I did this video uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago maybe and the reason I'm doing it again is one that I felt my original video was too short, I didn't spend enough time on some of these albums and secondly after a year and a half of intensive listening my opinion has shifted somewhat. I want to take this opportunity now to ask you to click like and subscribe, please click that bell so you get uh, notified of any future uploads and do check out my Patreon. Also I'd like to stress that the opinions expressed in this video are purely that, my own opinions, my own personal preferences. I'd certainly be interested in yours and how you would rank these albums. Also unofficially I think we should call this video Rush, Good, Better, Best. And with no further ado let's start looking at the good albums shall we? Number 19 is Test for Echo from 1996. Now Geddy Lee has gone on record to say that, that this was a creative low for the band. It was a time when they were struggling creative, creatively to find direction. Nevertheless, that being said, one thing I really do love about this record, I find the cover really, really striking. It depicts a can or um, in a shook or in a shook, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, which was essentially a, a figure in sort of human form left by Inuits to mark a food cache or uh, a marker of some distinction where somebody was lost or had lost their way or had lost their lives perhaps. Run, one rather waggish critic has pointed out that it's uh, quite an ironic image considering this is an album that seems to lack direction from a band that seems to have lost their way. Nevertheless I love the sort of thematic anchor of this record which is all about communication and affirmation as far as I'm concerned. And Neil Peart has gone on to say that it's an album inspired by time away from themselves and their audience. Uh, he said, if I may refer to my notes, um, everybody needs an echo, some affirmation to know that not alone. And I love the image in the booklet of the lone wolf baying at the moon, sort of engaging in its own test for echo. There are elements on this record that I really, really enjoy, the songs that speak of sort of heavy emotional burdens. I think Russia are at their very, very best when they deal with deep sort of metaphysical polemics, uh, always have been from sort of fly by night onwards. I love the title track specifically and I think Alex Lifeson's solo is absolutely uh, fabulous. In fact it creates the, it's the guitar melody on this song that gives it its core identity. It's eerie, subtle, nuanced, with some you know, wonderful bass lines as well I may add. Also one of my favourites on this record is the, the song Half the World. And the sound on this record is gloriously heavy which I always enjoy, you know, it, it, this album explores some really interesting ideas, lyrics, some um, uh, beautiful sort of musical phrasings, but ultimately it's certainly not one of their better later releases. And number 18 is Vapor Trails from 2002. This was an album that was supposed to be their comeback album in many respects. Uh, unfortunately it was an album that was let down by, by dreadful production. I much prefer the reissued version, it sounds less compressed than the, the original. I don't know what the consensus is amongst Rush fans on this. Um, great songs on this album, I love One Little Victory, Earthshine, Ghost Rider and Vapor Trail, uh, songs that seem to resonate with the difficulties the band were experiencing at the time. This album came at the end of an extended hiatus the band were enjoying, although I don't know if enjoying is the right word here. Uh, obviously Neil Peart was having to deal with some pretty awful uh, personal tragedies at the time uh, as well. I love the image evoked by the title of this album, it seems to denote something left behind as we're propelled forward in this world, uh, very much about our own legacy and what we leave behind. It's uh, an image that's uh, imbued of a sense of sadness and a sense of pathos. Number 17 is Rush from 1974. Now I realise I might ruffle a few feathers putting the debut album so low, but uh, nevertheless this, this album is a a powerful opening statement, it bristles with energy, but for me it just lacks the profundity and uh, conceptual brilliance which comes with Neil Peart, of course from Fly By Night onwards. The band certainly announced themselves on this record with that explosive guitar riff of Finding My Way and Geddy Lee sort of wailing like Robert Plant. In fact that's the main criticism of this album, many critics have argued that this album feels uh, too derivative, it feels like the, the bastard progeny of sort of Led Zeppelin and Cream. But that being said, a lot of sort of debut albums by a lot of bands are often derivative in many respects while they're still finding their way, no pun intended. Of course the energy on this record is infectious, making it a thoroughly enjoyable listen. And of course it contains Working Man, a song that the band have often sort of played live or referenced in concert. In fact Geddy Lee has gone on record as saying it's, it's his favourite song to play live. I think I must be in the minority when I actually say I love the cover of this album. It has a kind of explosive sort of pop art quality to it. Almost as if it's uh, struggling to contain the energy of the music they're in. 
It was supposed to be bright red, of course, but due to a printing error, it came up magenta. The original drama does an absolutely fine job on this record, but for me, without Neil Peart and his um, a sort of thematic and rhythmic elements that he brings to the band, it doesn't quite feel like Rush. On listening to this record, there's no doubt that Alex Lifeson and Geddy Lee are brilliant instrumentalists, brilliant musicianship on this record, but it also sort of firmly establishes that Neil Peart is the essential and missing piece of the jigsaw. I think for me, I see this album as a signpost to the brilliance and the genius that was to come later. The band's own test for Echo, just see if there was anyone out there listening. It's a wonderful opening statement. Number 16 is Hold Your Fire from 1987. No doubt this is an album that displays some exquisite musicianship and some interesting musings and lyrics from Neil Peart. For me, the problem I have with this album is essentially the way it sounds. I've gone on record saying I generally do not like those um, pr the production values of the 1980s, that big sort of roomy artificial sound that sort of infected a lot of albums of this time. In fact, a lot of bands are now going back to their 80s catalogue and stripping away those sort of 1980s affectations uh, to make them sound more authentic. More notably, Pink Floyd, of course, recently with their album Momentary Lapse of Reason. For me, a lot of these albums from this period feel polluted in many respects, sonically at least. Nevertheless, it's an album that contains one of my favourite Rush songs, and that is Time Stands Still. It's such a beautiful and profound sentiment that trembles with existential terror. The realisation that everything is slipping away, that the moment cannot be held on, the moment is, is past uh, as, immediately as soon as it occurs. And of course that sense of profundity is, is underlined, I think, underpinned by the beautiful and haunting vocal of Amy Mann, that vocal refrain. But certainly that idea that everything is slipping from us is ultimately what connects us. It reminds me of a line from um, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol where he says that it reminds us that uh, we are all just fellow travellers on the way to the grave. There are other songs, of course, that I think are outstanding on this record. Force 10. I love the sort of solemn voices that leads, sort of lead into the keyboard parts. Open Secrets has a beautiful solo to it. And Second Nature. Uh, I love there's a line in that song which really resonates with me. I think it's quite interesting politically as well. We fight the fire whilst feeding the flames. Prime Mover is also an outstanding number on this uh, album with some brilliant sort of bass lines by Geddy Lee. I love the sentiment expressed in the lyric, the point of the journey is, is not just to arrive or something like that. A point of course echoed by uh, Neil Peart in his travel writings. I also love the track Mission, I love the solo on this song, I love the way the band are exploring uh, the use of sort of different time signatures. Neil Peart's drumming on this is absolutely brilliant as well. It's quite possible as well that I, I may well be in the minority when I say I really love the cover of this album. It's very minimalistic, but it, it's quite striking, I think. A great cover for a great album. And number 15 is Counterparts from 1993. I think with the, right from the get-go with this album, we certainly get that impression that that clean-cut, synth-infused rush of the 1980s is certainly gone. Um, and mind you, you know, we could say that from sort of presto onwards, really. And like all Rush albums, of course, the musicianship on this record is absolutely top-notch. You get Alex Lifeson's paradoxically nonchalant sort of guitar style. I say paradoxically because it, it, his guitar playing is actually very, very complex. Uh, that's beautifully complemented, of course, by Geddy Lee's um, wonderful sort of bass flourishes and Neil Peart's incendiary sort of drum playing and fills that infuse this record. It's an album that is gloriously heavy, which I certainly enjoy for that reason. In fact, critics at the time used the adjective grungy to describe it. I think the opening trio of Animate, Stick It Out and Cut to the Chase are the finest uh, songs on the album. Of course, that's a matter of opinion, but Cut to the Chase is, is beautiful with its um, very clean guitar line before exploding into that chorus where everything is uh, ramped up to sort of notch 11 on the amplifiers. The lyrics are also interesting on this record. Uh, Neil Peart certainly explores some very dark emotional themes. And that, of course, is melded with um, uh, impeccable musicianship that's conjoined with this that cathartic yet disaffected sort of grunge feel to it. Now, this may have just been where the band were emotionally at the time when they made this record. I don't want to in any way suggest that Rush are a follower of trends. But uh, it certainly does have a, um, a, quite a, a sludgy feel to this record. And it's that that makes this record really interesting for me. The fact the band that are exploring some very interesting tones and textures on this one.
Stick It Out, of course, is worth mentioning. I love the guitar at the start of this. It has, um, you know, quite dark lyrics and a very prickly vibe of sort of iron spit, which very much define this record. Call Out for Double Agent and Alien Shore also saw great numbers that are, uh, are worth mentioning as well. I think Counterparts is uh, regarded by many Rush fans as a, very much a return to that guitar-driven sound, although I think they um, were kind of on that route, some sort of presto onwards, really. Number 14 is Snakes and Arrows from 2007. I think a lot of the tension that uh, infuses the Vapor Trails album has kind of been resolved by the time we get to this one. And that creative energy is no more apparent in, in the uh, track, uh, the opening track, in fact, Far Cry, which really assaults the senses from the get-go. Snakes and Arrows also includes a, quite a few instrumentals. I think perhaps more instrumentals than any other Rush album. I might be mistaken on that one, though. You know, but I take that as a positive. I take that as a, a sense that the band chemistry was really, really good at the time of making this record. For me, the real standout tracks on this album are Main Monkey Business, Hope and Malignant Narcissism. They really sort of strike me as being quite remarkable. Interestingly, Geddy Lee has said that uh, the songs um, Working Them, Angels and Faithless uh, are two songs he really enjoys playing live. A lot of critics at the time argued that this album was uh, too long, it was too bloated. I like to think it's just a testimony to the fact that the band were just really enjoying themselves and they were sort of very much immersed in the creative process and therefore they just produced a lot of material. Number 13 is Power Windows from 1985. I think a lot of the issues I have with the Hold Your Fire album is uh, also applies here. Um, this is certainly the most 80s influenced album. Uh, you know, it explores many of the sort of synth rock sort of pop sounds of the decade. Nevertheless, it's an interesting album. A lot of the lyrical themes touched upon uh, were very pertinent in the 1980s and, and they reflect on the very nature of greed and humanity. I particularly like the line from Territories where he says, we don't feed the people, but we feed the machines. And despite being what we call synth drenched, the guitar sound certainly manages to announce itself through the fog of those 1980s production values and is actually at times extremely effective, I would say beautiful. There's some great songs on this album, of course, Big Money with its critique of greed was um, pulled out, of course, for the last European tour, the last European dates they played. I think Manhattan Project as well, I'm not sure on that one. But I do think the sound of this album renders some great songs sounding rather cold and sterile. And this album, like Hold Your Fire, happens to contain one of my favourite Rush songs, and that's Emotion Detector. It's an album, like a lot of Rush's catalogue, of course, that rewards the listener with multiple listens. I, I think it's an album that is uh, it's incredibly nuanced and it certainly has a grace and a beauty to it. I gave this album a listen last night as I was making some notes about it and one of some of the songs that stood out, one was Marathon, of course, with some great instrumental work on it and a really infectious chorus. I love the, the idea that, that, that Marathon is a befitting metaphor for the endurance that is life. But that being said, it's also very complex and has a hypnotic quality to it. They explore some very interesting textures on this record. Um, I do feel that this album is incredibly melodic. I think that's something that it shares with the Presto album as well. Anyway, coming at number 13 for me is Power Windows from 1985. Number 12 is Clockwork Angels from 2012. This is a stunningly beautiful album which contains The Garden, of course. Now, The Garden has a grace and balletic quality to it. It's uh, a valediction, it feels like a valediction, a farewell, which has added poignancy, of course, since the very sad passing of Neil Peart. We see with this record a return to the concept album, reminiscent, of course, of their 70s output. I love that sort of very dystopian steampunk world that Neil Peart immerses us in, at the centre of which is an individual that has to do battle with the forces of order and chaos. He's immersed in this very carnivalesque world of uh, it's full of tones and textures and shades and shadows of pirates and anarchists and great many things of shoes and ceiling wax and cabbages and kings. And we get the watchmaker, of course, who hovers over the proceedings like a huge Cheshire cat. He's a symbol of authoritarian power and rules everything with this sterile precision. There's no doubt this record is a cohesive and immersive listen, and I love all the sort of literary references that are peppered throughout. I gave this album a good listen to this morning, and I, one th some of the things that struck me were uh, Alex's guitar sound is very assured and certainly announced itself. The acoustic elements sound uh, incredibly bright and rich uh, as well. Geddy's bass is clear and precise, and his voice, I think these songs are recorded with his more aged voice in mind and because of that we got a lot more sort of emotional expression from him. Neil Peart's drumming his technical mastery as always 
it's a wonderful record we're, we're greeted with this uh, marvelous cross-pollination of musical forms we get a uh, jazz blues uh, you know, rock prog and it, there's even some flamenco flourishes on it as well there's certainly no doubt that this album is a fine closing act number 11 is presto from 1989 now this album is one that's often maligned by critics but for me it's a, a beautifully melodic album it has that in common with power windows i think you know, I love some of the, the, the textures explored on this record. It has a very bright, crisp sound to it. This album was supposed to be seen as a return to that sort of power trio and moving away from that whole sort of synth period. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, there's a lot of people that are, are very disparaging about Rush's synth period, but I personally think Signals and Grace Under Pressure are absolutely fabulous albums. However, by the time I think you get to Hold Your Fire and Power Windows, I think we're drifting dangerously close to sort of over-affected 80s rock pop music. Like Clockwork Angels, I gave this album a thoroughly good listen to this morning. I made some notes about some of the, some of the tracks, uh, if you'll indulge me. Um, Show Don't Tell, I love the guitar textures on this one. It's very arresting, uh, as I said, very bright and certainly announces itself. Uh, Chain Lightning, a lovely discordant guitar sound at the beginning, enigmatic and dissonant. But I think The Pass is probably my favourite song on this album. It's incredibly infectious, like a, like a rash. I read some interesting reviews. Seems that the critics are not over keen on this one. Uh, I'll read one uh, quote uh, to you. One, one guy has said, This album lacks the existential and spiritual themes that Rush's preceding albums had, which gave them their magic, amplified the music, and gave their albums coherence. I don't share this opinion, really. I do not share the sort of critical snub of this record. I think it's... It's an album like all Rush albums that rewards its listener with multiple listens for it to really shine. And it's an album that's really worth investing in. Anyway, let's continue with our ranking of the Rush albums worst to best. Uh, not that we're actually calling it that, of course. We've certainly looked at the good albums, the better. Now let's concern ourselves with the very best records that Rush put out. Number 10 is Fly By Night from 1975. This, of course, is the beginning of that classic Rush sound. I mean, there's a lot that's... Um, that comes from the debut album as well. There's, there's, you still got that very tight, driven, brilliant musicianship that very much defines that first album. And Neil Peart certainly imposes himself on this one. We get uh, a, a lot more sort of literary themes, much more sort of influences from European prog that are brought into the mix, exploration of time signatures, and more ambitious pieces like Bonnie Tour and the Snow Dog, which makes my top 10 Rush songs, by the way. But this was certainly the start of those literary and fantasy themes, and perhaps reached their pinnacle with the marvellous medium-bibing medieval foray that is Farewell to Kings. So there's certainly no doubt about it, this is certainly a landmark Rush record. I found this little bit of information on Wikipedia, if you'll indulge me. In a review for Statesville Record and Landmark, Pam Simon thought the album is a strange schizophrenic record, almost evenly divided between second-rate acoustic music and the dated concept of the power trio format. I suppose one can only hope she's been burnt in effigy since writing that. I love the musicianship on this album. I think Alex contributes some fantastically noodly guitar parts and Geddy Lee holds his own without a doubt. Um, it's certainly a young band finding their way or finding their sound, so to speak. For me, the standout tracks are Bytor on the Snow Dog and Anthem. Anthem, of course, is drawn from the same title dystopian no uh, novella by the Russian-American writer Ayn Rand, which, of course, would be a ma uh, major influence for 2112. As I was listening to this record and doing some research on it, I found this very interesting review from the Metal Archives, which I will share with you. Peart's drumming on this album is problematic. His playing is amazing, but it's rarely tasteful. It makes the listening experience to many of these songs a jarring one rather than a contemplative one. I say a contemplative one because other highly skilled rock drummers hold back more and make you listen closer to figure out how good they really are, such as Bill Bruford, Stuart Copeland, Ginger Baker and John Bonham, whereas Neil simply whacks you over the head with his best drum fills. Ouch. Uh, I personally don't agree with that. I'd certainly be interested to, to know how you feel about how Neil Peart's drumming uh, announces itself on this record and how it goes on to develop with subsequent albums. Anyway, there's no doubt that Rush was certainly taking flight on this record. An awful pun, but a great album. 
Number nine is Roll the Bones from 1991. A bit of a controversial choice, perhaps. A lot of people seem to hate this album, but I absolutely adore it. I think it's fabulous. I actually share my ranking of this album with Ultimate Classic Rock, who also pictured at number nine. In my opinion, this is the, the best of the later albums. By later albums, I mean everything post Hold Your Fire. It very much continues with that guitar-driven sound that we got on Presto, but I think the production values on this album is better than Presto. It's not as brittle. A lot of critics have poured a lot of hate and scorn upon this record, and I don't really understand where that comes from. Uh, in fact, uh, Rachel Music, the website has said, describes this album as watered down and cheesy. And I know we all have different opinions about music, and music can affect us in different ways, but I, I, I struggle to uh, understand how anyone can dislike this one. I love the fact that the tracks on this album lyrically deal with the concept of chance. Uh, in fact, the title was taken from a, a fiction story by Fritz Lieber. I hope I've said that correctly. If you think about some of the songs on this album, Dreamtime is absolutely incredible. I, I love that track. And a, a great line in there, uh, Time is a Gypsy Caravan That Steals Away in the Night. Bravado is another great one. I love the reference to Icarus at the beginning. And again, another great line in... Um, we pay the price, but we will not count the cost. It has a nice alliterative quality to it. And Face Up, of course, is on this one. It has uh, perhaps one of the best Rush intros ever. So for me, love it or hate it, my personal choice is Roll the Bones at number nine. Number eight is Caress of Steel from 1975. I think it's fair to say after the relative success of Fly By Night, the band wanted to continue to explore those uh, lengthier conceptual pieces uh, represented by tracks like Bite on the Snow Dog and, and Rivendell of course with its fantasy theme Tolkien-esque stuff going on. Nevertheless interestingly Geddy Lee is in recent interviews has said that the band were fairly stoned when they made this record in fact he's even described some of it as sounding rather goofy although that doesn't in any way distract from the fact that the Necromancer and the Fountain of Lamneth are, are inventive powerful and beautifully constructed pieces Although I have to say that the Necromancer seems to be a little bit of a homage to Yes's Heart of the Sunrise. If you listen to about 8 minutes 30 into it, you can certainly hear the influence there. Bastille Day is one of my favourites on this album. I love the sort of metallic guitar tones that Alex Lifeson achieves on this record. It's, um, this song provides a platform for that virtuoso, virtuoso hard rock uh, re reputation, of course, that the band had cemented on their first two albums. I think I'm Going Bald is one that I don't particularly listen to very often, probably for the obvious reasons. Now, I did read somewhere, which was quite interesting, is that the song, in some ways, is a bit of a parody of the Kiss song Going Blind. Going Blind, of course, featured on their 1974 album, Hotter Than Hell. Of course, Rush support Kiss at a, about this time. Lakeside Park is uh, beautifully atmospheric, although it's been described as lousy by Geddy Lee in an interview he did for Raw magazine in 1993. I don't know if he had his tongue firmly placed in cheek when he said that. But I think it's fair to say that this album has been much maligned and misunderstood by an awful lot of people. But you can't help but admire the band's spirit, vision and ambition on this record. It's a record that's been described by all music as imperfectly perfect. Caress of Steel for many is considered their first sort of prog album and it's infused with that sort of mystical imagery and sort of progressive song suites that they would continue with for uh, 2112, Farewell to Kings, Hemispheres and albums like that. It's an eclectic album, we get that sort of thundering trudge of Bastille Day as well as the otherworldly feel of tracks like uh, The Necromancer and The Fountain of Lamneth. There's certainly no doubt about it, The Caress of Steel is an important album in terms of this band's evolution, those sort of heavy prog slash psychedelic sort of lengthier pieces uh, as firmly cemented on this one. But, you know, it's an album that, uh, it's a landmark album, but it could have easily been a landfill album in many respects, as it didn't do very well. In fact, the band went on to call their subsequent tour the Down the Tubes tour. Thankfully, of course, uh, 2112 managed to pluck them from the abyss. This is a, a colossal work, and we can't help but marvel at its mastery and magnificence, and of course the albums that follow it. Uh, and to quote from the Fountain of Lamneth, it's an album that fascinates and captivates, not only myself, of course, but every subsequent new generation of Rush fans. Number seven is Grace Under Pressure from 1984. I think it's fair to say that Rush's synth period is often much maligned by fans, but this album is, uh, epitomizes grace and mastery in terms of its compositions and songwriting. It's an album that sees them moving away from that lumbering metal anachronism, which was a label that they were given by some in the music press at the time. It's certainly a remarkable record. 
one thing that's interesting about Grace Under Pressure is it creates uh, quite a nihilist tone in some places. I mean, it was described by one critic, if I may refer to my notes, as creating an atmosphere that is incredibly cold. Even Alex Lifeson's guitar has an icy tinge to it, and Geddy Lee's keyboard patches are piercingly abrasive. And the lyrics, of course, are deliciously dark, some might say apocalyptic. Songs like uh, Distant Early Warning and The Enemy Within have sort of the shivery tones of espionage to them. Of course, you know, the Cold War was still raging at this time. And that's evoked in the tones of, of much of the material. For example, Red Sector and the Body Electric has a very close and oppressive feel, um, a, a sense of unease and dread. It's worth noting, of course, that a lot of the dark themes are married with sort of upbeat tempos, which makes this an interesting album of contrast and juxtapositions. It's an album that also expresses the the essential human need not to be ground down. I, I think in the song Enemy Within, Geddy Lee sings, I'm not giving in to security under pressure. And of course you get Neil Peart's interest in sci-fi in The Body Electric, all about an android on the run. I read the review of this album in Rolling Stone magazine. Obviously Rolling Stone were a huge fan of Rush. And they said, um, it lacked, this album lacks melody and any but the most rudimentary harmonic development. I strongly disagree. I think this album strikes a perfect balance between experimentation, lyricism, melody, uh, with some strong social commentary as well. A truly brilliant and frosty offering from this band. Number six is 2112 from 1976. The fantasy themes and extended song suites continue on this record despite the commercial failure of Caress of Steel. It was an incredibly brave album in that respect, the fact that the band continue to pursue what they want to do. Of course, Lemmy from Motorhead said, selling your heart is the true epitome of prostitution. And you've got to expect, you've got to admire the band's integrity in, in continuing on the, on the road that they wanted to after Caress of Steel. They could have so easily capitulated and produced something that the record company wanted them to do. There's no doubt about it that Russia's hard rock sci-fi shtick, as it was described by many critics at the time, was seen as out of place, a bit of a blot on the topography of the musical landscape. Of course, it was a, a, a musical environment where disco had already seized the hearts, minds and trousers of a generation. And of course, in England, things were about to get ugly as the Fleming nihilism of punk was about to announce itself. Then throw into the mix, of course, three gawky looking Canadians in silk kimonos. 2112 is a concept album, certainly in part, of course, which deals with a very dystopian narrative about an individual struggle against a totalitarian system. A track inspired by the writings of Ayn Rand. I mean, certainly the track fluctuates between different moods and atmospheres, you know, to reflect, for example, the journey, you know, that sense of unease, restlessness, discovery, isolation, of course, liberation, ultimately, we have assumed control. It's a track very much composed in the tradition of other dystopian narratives like 1984, Brave New World, for example. It's amazing how this album gets into your under your skin, becomes very much a part of your DNA. I remember every power chord, every giddily shriek, every drum fill. It's uh, it's part of the collective unconsciousness now, isn't it? I especially love the part where the um, protagonist discovers a guitar. What strange device can this be? He says, and then Alex Lifeson's guitar beautifully complements that. It's a wonderful example of metaphorical instrumentation, as Brian Wilson talks of pet sounds using the same sort of technique where the guitar sound beautifully evokes tentativeness before um, that sort of life affirming intergalactic soloing no doubt causing great disturbances in the force other tracks worth mentioning of course are the weed inspired travelogue that is Passage to Bangkok and Tears is one of my favourites on this album uh, perhaps out of sync for everybody else on that one but I'm just a sucker for the sound of a Mellotron this is a beguiling record with a very distinctive sound from the uh, drumming and incendiary tempo shifts that we get on it from Geddy Lee's Squawk of Doom to the beautiful atmospheric colouring we get with Alex Lifeson's guitar. It's an album that's got to make any fans top five, or at least threaten it in my case. Number five is Permanent Waves from 1980. It's quite a refreshing sounding record as we move away from those quite sprawling epic pieces and avant-garde instrumentation. It's now where we're treated to shorter, yet equally complex and lyrically profound pieces. Of course, the actual title was coined by Neil Peart when he talked about cultural waves and uh, classic albums were like a, a permanent wave, I think he said. 
Of course, the album kicks off with that very famous Alex Lifeson riff, a song very much loved ironically by daytime radio these days, but there's some also some epic pieces on this album. For example, uh, Jacob's Ladder, which refers to a meteorological phenomenon rather than the Old Testament angelic ascent and descent. And then, of course, we get the beautifully multi-sectioned natural science. Complex chord forms, insane drum fills, are very much what uh, define the sound of this album, not to mention some deliciously infectious melodies, Entre Nous, for example. Reading an awful lot of articles uh, for this ranking video, it came to my attention that the music press certainly don't seem to like Rush, which means that any self-respecting music fan must become a passionate devotee of this band. But, you know, you get Geddy Lee's stratospheric Wales, Neil Peart's philosophical excursions, uh, exploring the realms of philosophy and sci-fi. You can certainly see why the beard strokers at NME just didn't get them. This album feels like a resounding fuck you to the established pillars of rock journalism. A wonderful album that has crippling riffs, mysticism, uh, torturous tempo changes, a bit like Yes on steroids. This is the album that introduces Rush to the new decade. Piet's lyrics are imbued with beauty and wisdom, especially on uh, Free Will, of course, it's one of the best songs on the album. And maybe just my imagination, but I think Geddy Lee's voice sounds even more expressive on this record. And Alex Lifeson's guitar parts uh, adding a tonal quality that is just absolutely sublime, especially on Jacob's Ladder, which has a, a broad, sort of almost panoramic tonal quality to it. Natural Science is an extended piece, uh, a beautiful piece of music on this album. Of course, it's a song that replaces the original idea, and that was Neil Peart was going to write a song based on Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, but obviously, it was it was dropped. The idea was dropped as it, it was believed not to be really in fitting with the tone of the rest of the album. But in my opinion, this album denotes an interesting development in terms of the evolution of the the band's sound and compositional style. And before it signals from 1982. Of course, this is the record that sees the band moving towards those banks of synthesizers and other sort of digital wizardry, uh, creating a kind of an electronic haze. I think one critic has described this album as the oral equivalent of dry ice. Certainly different modes of expression and sound are effectively mined during this period, and my God, the results are impressive. Instead of just churning out a kind of technological sludge, which are, I think a lot of bands who embrace technology, specifically new technology at this time, were, were kind of guilty of. Uh, with Rush, uh, this album sounds invigorated, fresh and dynamic. You get tracks like Countdown, of course, that were written shortly after the Space Shuttle Columbia's launch. And The Weapon, which is a marvellous number, forms part of Neil Peart's Fear trilogy. And of course, Subdivisions. I mean, Subdivisions is one of my favourite Rush songs of all time. That wonderful exploration of sort of adolescent social grouping and subdivisions, if you like, as well as taking a look at the uh, the, top, the topography of, sort of the urban landscape. And Neil Peart's drumming is impressive on this one, and Geddy Lee's voice is so beautifully melodic. What I love about the use of synthesizers on this record is that they're not in any way uh, strained or intrusive. It just all feels so natural. A lot of the fans were not particularly happy with this, what they call the synth period, that sort of post moving pictures, pre counterparts. And there's no doubt about it, of course, Signals is that line in the sand, that demarcation between the heavy rock and prog rush and the more new wave synth driven sound that they pursue in the 1980s. But that's what's great about this band, they were constantly evolving, venturing out, exploring new territories. I make them sound a bit like the Starship Enterprise. But they were always incorporating new sounds and new textures, and specifically on this album, which really marks it as, as very different from a lot of the sort of 1980s albums that kind of overdid it with the thin, reedy sounding guitar, the drum, the electronic drums, of course, and synth horns, uh, and those sort of heavy sort of 1980s production affectations, which I personally cannot stand. Uh, all those are mercifully absent from this record. Certainly what Rush seemed to be doing at this time is sort of cultivating an atmospheric chilliness, which is uh, really, really interesting. Of course, it comes to its fruition, I think, on Grace Under Pressure. I love the analog kit, especially when it's juxtaposed with the more robotic, metropolis-sounding Digital Man. You could argue Digital Man is the, the future for the analog kit, or codes, data streams, and processing. I have to say this song sounds suspiciously like the police is walking on the moon. Of course, it's, this song is salvaged from such a comparison by Alex Lifeson's solo, which screams out from the digital sprawl of the world evoked by this record. 
Some interesting information that I found on Wikipedia, if you'll indulge me, was that, if I may quote, writer and journalist Greg Quill noted the cyclical framework in Signal, specifically the album opening in suburbia, followed by the contemplating escaping it in the analog kid. Then universal human imponderables are explored through humanity, sex and religion and ageing, which ends in the actual escape in Countdown. Quill spoke to Neil Peart about this theory, to which the drummer replied, oh, you noticed that? We were hoping nobody would. Anyway, the band produced a chillingly good album in Signals. Number three is Farewell to Kings from 1977. The listener cannot help but be impressed by the superb musicianship and the vivid and compelling lyrics on this album. You get the beautiful Madrigal and of course Cinderella Man, which is a, a Geddy Lee Pen number. We're taken on a journey to the heart of a black hole. And then of course you get Xanadu, which is Neil Peart's take on the Samuel Taylor Coleridge poem with dazzling guitar by Alex Lyson and allusions to pleasure domes and honeydew, all lifted from the Coleridge poem, of course. Uh, I read somewhere that um, this is Rush's Stairway to Heaven. Then we get Cygnus Book One, of course, a wonderful journey, of course, that's continued on with the next album, Hemispheres. I mean, how bold a move is that? A traveler gallivanting around the universe in a ship named after Don Quixote's horse. Uh, before being sucked into a black hole to witness a colossal battle between Apollo and Dionysus. Also, what is really intriguing about this album is the tonal quality it has, no doubt um, brought on by the band's interest in using uh, synths and, uh, and other things, of course, which not only add an, a specific atmosphere, but also add a very interesting melodic counterpoint in, in tracks like uh, Madrigal and Xanadu, for example. In that respect, you could say this album certainly seems to be pointing in the direction the band would be going in, in the next two or three years. And part of the atmosphere that's evoked on this record is the other use of sort of... Uh, instruments and percussive instruments the band employ for example wind chimes temple blocks glockenspiels and tubular bells of course certainly Geddy Lee considers this album to be a pivotal one in terms of the band's development and exploration of sounds and textures one can't help but marvel at the scope and the ambition of this record especially Cygnus Book One as I've said that sees the protagonist battling uh, the Greek god Apollo uh, rationality and of course irrationality represented ra irrationality and chaos represented by Dionysus. Farewell to Kings is a technologically dazzling and immersive listening experience with its medieval vibe and feel its madrigals and acoustic passages all played by Canadians in capes. Meanwhile the barbarian horde or spandex and safety pins were fast emerging from the inner city areas all bile and phlegm enraged at such musical obfuscation. Number two is Hemispheres from 1979. It's now where we see the band still using um, complex multi-movement song structures. Interesting use of course, intricate rhythms and varying time signatures as well. Of course, it, ex it continues to explore Neil Peart's interest in sci-fi fantasy. Obviously, the very deep, profound and philosophical conceptual ideas continue to be explored on this album, especially in the critique of the human psyche uh, via the left and right portions of the brain. Hence the title of the album, of course. Cygnus Book 2 and that ultimate battle of the heart and mind is, is uh, intriguing listening. Of course, that continues until it's all unified in one perfect sphere. Uh, a utopia is achieved. One of the highlights of the, on this album, in my opinion, is The Trees. It's a wonderful critique of collectivism. And Lifeson certainly steals the show on this one of his classical and acoustic guitar textures. In a tale all about the struggle for ascendance. And then, of course, we get La Villa Strangiato, of course, which simply means Strange House, based on a dream by Alex Lyson. Apparently, the piece was so complex and intricate it had to be recorded in three sessions, or at least three parts. We get an incredible intro to this song before it leads into what one critic has described as uh, like a world awakening from a long slumber. And this is certainly emphasised by the very sort of dream, dreamy-like sort of flanged guitar, which adds to that otherworldly quality that this track has. I think we can all agree that this is an absolutely epic album. But the sound and ideas on this, on this album is all to change as the band decide they want to explore different tonal qualities and textures. Textures and tonal qualities, of course, that for some were made the band far more accessible, but certainly no less brilliant. And number one is Moving Pictures from 1981. This album, of course, is a testament to the fact that Rush were incredibly versatile and diverse and wanted to explore, as I've said before, sort of new sonic possibilities. And with this album, we get a different aesthetic on display, a new kind of musical and lyrical husbandry, an approach, of course, that started with uh, Permanent Waves. 
Moving Pictures is a remarkable album. I fully concur with you discover music when they say, and I may quote, Moving Pictures is their most graceful and perfectly weighted midpoint between a past that resembles a Roger Dean cloud map and a clean, straight-edged digital present that fancied itself as a Piet Mondrian thumbing a lift in a Tron cityscape. I particularly like the track The Camera Eye. It's a, it's a wonderful painting of a frenetic cityscape. It's like a series of metropolitan vignettes that has a very dreamlike quality to it. And Witch Hunt, of course, which is one of my favourite Rush songs of all time on this album, is, is wonderful in its dealing with mass hysteria and delusion. Limelight, another standout track, of course, with that crunching guitar riff that deals effectively with Neil Peart's unease with fame, employing that uh, beautiful Shakespearean metaphor. Another Shakespearean line that would be appropriate for this one would be, all that glitters is not gold. Then, of course, there's Tom Sawyer, which is perhaps the most famous song on this album. It started life as a poem called Louis the Lawyer, or Louis the Lawyer, I think. But nevertheless, it's a perfect vehicle to explore certain ideas and themes. If I may quote Neil Peart himself, the themes of reconciling the boy and man in myself and the difference between what people are and what others perceive them to be. You know, it's a complex number that beautifully incorporates that American literary metaphor. If you read Tom Sawyer, of course, it's a book that's very much about uh, adventure and about self-discovery. And I think that's kind of where Neil Peart was going with this song. But more importantly, I think this song serves very much the band's modus operandi at this time. Um, a shimmering spatial exploration of a synthesized new dawning. And YYZ is another interesting one, of course, it takes its code from, uh, if I may refer to my notes, Toronto Pearson International Airport. It's a, a lovely piece of music that has this almost trance-like motif, and Alex Lyson is, is fabulous with that, his whammy bar and fuse guitar with its sort of swoops and dives. It's, uh, it's a remarkable track to listen to. And if you talk about moving pictures, you have to mention Red Bar Chatter, of course. It's a wonderful open road parable based on the short story A Nice Morning Drive by uh, Richard Foster, of course, published in 1973. It's a fascinating number set in the future, of course, where fossil fuels have been outlawed. And obviously this song is a vehicle, if you excuse the pun, for Neil Peart to explore his love of classic cars. But for me, this song embodies a sense of freedom that you can imagine him barreling down the highways, no doubt pursued by an enraged Greta Thunberg. But joking aside, it's an absolutely remarkable number. And it has to be said, I love Alex Lifeson's contribution, those glittering harmonics that just shimmer. It's absolutely perfect. I think Rush and expanding their own sort of musical world view, uh, specifically on this album and other albums, they effectively enrich ours. There's no doubt about it in my mind that Moving Pictures is a gratifyingly satisfying listen and makes my number one. Anyway, that's us done. You've been listening to one of my ranking videos or a redoing of one of my ranking videos. Please click like and subscribe, check out the Facebook page, but more importantly, please do keep listening.